Well, good to see you all the, this morning. Uh, through all the noise and hustle, uh, what is Christmas all about? Uh, if you're not a follower of Christ, you couldn't have chosen a more perfect uh, Sunday to attend. I want to talk today about what Christmas is all about. Uh, teenager, single, married, empty nester, I want to explain what the heart of the Christian faith entails. Uh, Christmas faith is the belief that there is a God and that you can trust him. Uh, we find an example of this faith in the Old Testament with a man named Abraham. God called Abraham about 4,000 years ago uh, to leave his home, Ur in the Chaldees, which is like modern-day Iraq, and to travel to the land of Canaan, which is modern-day Israel. Uh, God tells Abraham to leave his home, and he's going to give him the land of the Canaanites. He, t- he asks him to look around when he gets there, and he says, All the land that you can see will be for your descendants forever. In Genesis chapter 13, we read, The Lord, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to, we're going to be starting at uh, Genesis 13. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and south to the east and west. All the land that you see I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Uh, He tells Abraham he's going to be a father of a great nation. He's going to have many offspring. Now this is... uh, unusual because at that time Abraham and his wife Sarah have no children he's thinking God are are you aware we have exactly zero kids how are we going to be a parents of a great generation and so in chapter 15 we read after this the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision he's now moved to the land of Canaan. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? Abraham is now like 80. His wife is 70. He says, God, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky. Look at the stars. And if you can count them, so will your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So Abraham went home. He said, Sarah, we're going to have a baby. Now, don't you be joking with me, Abram. Verse 18 of chapter 15. On, the day, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. Then chapter 17 When Abram was 99 years old. Now this has been 24 years since God called him at the age of 75 out of the land of the Chaldees. 24 years have passed since he made him this promise that you're going to be a father of a great nation. Yet nothing has happened. Abram says, God, we've tried. It was fun trying, but we've got nothing to show for it. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, let's see, I lost my place. This is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I've made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I'll make nations of you. Kings will come from you. 
I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So he makes a covenant with him. He calls him to leave Mesopotamia, his home, and to move to the land of Canaan, and uh, modern-day Israel, it would include uh, what we know as Israel, the Sinai, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, uh, Jordan. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarah. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? Abraham believed God, but it was getting kind of hard at their age. Why did God choose Abraham? Why did he decide to shower his grace on Abraham? Make him the father of a great nation. We find nothing in Abraham's credentials that would have caught God's attention. But there is something about Abraham that explains God's choice of him. It's because Abraham had faith to believe God, to leave where he lived, to go to a new place, and that God was going to give him all that land, and to believe at the age of 100 and his wife 90 that God was going to give them a child. Abraham responded in faith. This tells you something important about you in your life. If you believe in God, God can do great things with you. I think the thing we learned from Abraham is that we are made right with God by grace through faith. Parents, talk about this with your children. It's so easy to, to get thinking that the way to uh, get right with God uh, is, to, is by what we do. Uh, but that's not the way. I want to ask three questions about Abraham's faith. I want to explore three questions about what it means to have faith at Christmas. Question number one, why... Why are we made right with God by grace through faith rather than by works? I think the natural inclination is for us to think is the way to get into heaven is to do more good things than bad. It's like we have a, a scale and we've done bad things, but if our good things are heavier, then God will let us in. Wasn't uh, Abraham... Uh, Accepted by God because of the good things he did? My th Martin Luther asked, If I s smite my body 50 times so that God will accept me, how can I know that he doesn't require 51 times? That's the problem with thinking that we can earn a relationship with God by how good we are. We never know if we've done enough. If it takes being good to be accepted by God then uh, one solution is to lower God's standard of how good we have to be. If we can make it lower, like some churches have done, we also reduce uh, Christianity's appeal. Suppose a coach, football coach, says to his players, all right, this year we're going to have fun. Come to practice if you want. Game time, uh, show up 20 minutes before the game. Uh, we're not going to work too hard this year. We're just going to learn, learn a few plays. And, uh, uh, well, that team would have a, a fun time, but they would have a losing season. And most of the players would drop off the team. He's killed the joy of the sport by reducing the standards. So how can we be made right with God? We are made right with God by grace through faith. God's grace. The Apostle Paul writes, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. So apart from the law, 
God has made a way for us to have a relationship with him by grace, by sending his son, which we celebrate at Christmas. But now our righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We've all sinned, so we all fall short of God's perfect standard. We can't rely on our good behavior to get into heaven. He grants us his gift of grace through Christ coming as a baby and his dying on the cross for our sins. It's not because of anything good that we've done, but because of his grace, his love. When Martin Luther... The great reformer understood this passage. He then realized there was no need for purgatory. Purgatory was the doctrine that was made because realizing that we all fall short of God's glory. And so we need a place like purgatory where we can kind of work off our sins. Martin Luther realized there's no reason for indulgences. That was like giving money to the church to work down your your sin. Uh, people in the 10th century would, would uh, plan trips to Palestine uh, where they could free it from the Turks. They'd give money to the church uh, to free Palestine or to build the, the cathedral at St. Peter's to reduce their days in purgatory. Then came the Diet of Worms, a very popular diet in those days. In 1521... Luther stood before the council at Worms and declared salvation is by grace through faith. He stood on the scriptures alone. He said, we're not saved by what we do, by working our sins off in purgatory or giving money to the church. It's by grace through faith. Paul's readers wondered, since salvation comes, Through faith and not by keeping the law, does this nullify our need for the law? Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Paul says the law was given so we understand that we fall short of God's standard, so we know that we need God's grace. The law makes us aware how badly we've messed up. We're made right with God by grace through faith. Question number two, is being made right with God by grace through faith a departure from Old Testament teaching? Uh, Paul's teaching that we're saved by grace through faith was a surprise to many Jews. They thought that we become righteous by keeping the law. Now, I've said to you uh, these past weeks that the Bible does not begin with the book of Genesis. It begins with the empty tomb. Uh, If Jesus had not been raised from the dead after he died on the cross, there would have been nothing to write about. But because he was raised, that showed that he was the Son of God, and at least four authors recorded for us the life of Christ. So they wrote in Koine Greek, which was known by educated people around the world, four Gospels and then 23 other books. This has become known as the New Testament written in Koine Greek, which is understand by common people around the world, but certainly by educated people. Well, then they began to get interested in the Hebrew Scriptures. But how are they going to read that? They can't read Hebrew. But thankfully, uh, and the reason they wanted to know about the Hebrew Scriptures is to find out about the coming of Christ, the prophecies about Christ. And they began to ask the question, well, if salvation's by faith, grace through faith, then why do we have the law? Do we need to keep it? They couldn't read that, but in the 3rd century B.C., scholars uh, translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, Koine Greek, and so they could read all about the backstory uh, to Christ. So, since it was salvation by grace through faith, many Jews began to think that Christianity was a sect that departed from the teaching of the Old Testament. So Paul teaches them from their own Hebrew scriptures 
that salvation never was by keeping the law. It was always by grace through faith. And the way he does it, by talking about Abraham. Abraham, everybody recognized as the father of the Hebrew nation. And he demonstrates that Abraham was not saved by his works, but by his faith. What then shall we say? This is Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was Abraham's faith that brought him right standing before God. Paul shows us that right in the first book of the Old Testament that salvation was always by grace through faith. It wasn't by being good enough, working hard enough. Paul goes on. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Abraham lived 400 years before Moses wrote the Old Testament law. He couldn't possibly have been justified by the Old Testament law. Romans 4, verse 18, against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. She was like 90. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. He believed that God would give him a son, even though he was 100 and his wife Sarah was 90. So Paul is showing that no one was ever justified before God by keeping the Old Testament law. Both Old and New Testaments teach the same message. We're saved by God's grace through our responding in faith. That's the heart of the Christian faith. That's the faith we have at Christmas. In Genesis 15, God promised Abraham that he would give him a son. He'd be the father of his amazing nation. Now, this is 25 years after his first call to Abraham to leave his come, uh, home and, and come to the land of Canaan and promises him he's going to be a father of a great nation. 25 years. It seems cruel from a human point of view that God would wait that long. But he wanted to show Abraham and all uh, uh, the, the, the Jewish followers of the nation that it's by God's supernatural power that this came to be. So if, if Abraham and Sarah had conceived a baby when Abraham was 75, she was 65, they might have thought, well, maybe we pulled this off. But at 190, it was very clear that this was by God's, by God's hand. They believed. How do we know this? Remember, you interpret the Old Testament by looking at the New Testament. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham... When called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was unable to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he, as good as dead, came to send us as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. They believed God. They were made right with God by responding to his grace by faith. Question number three. Is getting right with God by grace through faith available to all of us? Yes. If being made right with God depended on what we do, then some people couldn't qualify. Apostle Paul says, there is no one righteous, not even one. The doctrine that all people have sinned is a good doctrine. It puts us all on equal footing before God. It's a very democratic doctrine. It says we're all in this together. We've all messed up and fall short of God's glory. 
We are all equal in this crisis. If being made right with God, depending on keeping the law, how could the Gentiles have had a chance? They didn't even know about the Old Testament law. They couldn't read Hebrew. So Paul continues, Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there's only one God who will justify the circumcised, those are the Jews, by faith, and the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, through that same faith. Since we've all sinned, God's solution has to be for all of us. Since we're all equal in the crisis of sin, falling short of God's glory, we're all made equal before the cross of Christ. Jew and Gentile alike are saved by grace through faith. Because it's a free gift, all of us can qualify. Now, Satan's at work right now saying, don't you believe this? It can't be that easy. Come on, we all know there's no free lunch. But if God added one requirement beyond faith, some couldn't qualify. But because it's a gift of God's grace, all of us can qualify. All of us can have hope in the future. Two ladies were given the same job. This is uh, Tim Keller uh, writes this. And, uh, uh, and uh, it was, it was a, a manufacturing job where they were going to say, you're going to stand here and take part A, hook it up to part B, and then pass it down to the next person. These two ladies had uh, equal intelligence, equal uh, educational level. Uh, They both had similar personalities and temperaments. Uh, They were both uh, uh, put put in a room with uh, light and ventilation. Everything was the same. They were given breaks, you know, required breaks in an eight-hour day. Here was the difference. One of the ladies was told, at the end of the year, we will pay you $30,000. The other lady was told, at the end of the year, we'll pay you $30 million. So the ladies begin their work, and after a couple weeks, the one says to the other, oh, isn't this tedious? Isn't this awful just standing there all day long doing the same thing over and over again? Aren't you ready to quit? The other gal says, no, this is great. In fact, I whistle while I work. I love this job. What makes the difference between these two ladies? It's about their expectation of the future. Our expectation about the future makes all the difference in the world of how we deal with the challenges in our life. You can experience hope about the future that you are made right with God and you will go to heaven if you put your faith in Christ. You don't have to let problems in this world, rejections and setbacks, ground you. You can have hope. Ji Jing wrote uh, uh, Rejection Proof, and uh, he, he tells us in this book that his greatest fear growing up was the fear of rejection. He just hated it. And so uh, he uh, decided to go on a 100-day a blog, and he would, he would do things to be rejected so he could learn to handle rejection and deal with it. And he studied rejection, and he found that rejection, uh, how you handle it is all depends on your attitude, how you respond to it. Uh, it doesn't have to end your life and ruin your life. And he uh, cites uh, Michael Jordan as a great example. Michael Jordan... Uh, you know, when people get inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame, it's usually a speech, thank you, my parents, for what they did for me, you know, thank you for my coaches, and, and it's, it's pretty predictable and actually kind of boring. But there was nothing boring about Michael Jordan's induction in 2009. Over 23 minutes, he chronicled all the rejections in his basketball career that fueled him to be such a great player. He told about his varsity coach in high school not selecting him to be on varsity. 
and his coach, or uh, he, his, his roommate in college was named Carolina Player of the Year rather than Michael. He talked about commentators that said Michael Jordan is not as good as Magic Johnson or Larry Bird. He said all of those rejections added fuel to the fire to make me work to be a better player because I knew that I needed the motivation to become the best that I could be. So Jeng's point is people deal with rejection. They can turn it into a positive rather than a negative if they have the right attitude. Tom Brady's another example. Tom Brady was passed over in the draft 198 times. Now he's become the greatest quarterback in the history of football. He's won six Super Bowls. He said those rejections fueled his efforts to become the best quarterback he could be so that when he played the other teams that had passed him over, they would regret their decision. You can take whatever rejection or disappointment you faced and turn it into a positive by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and thanking God for His grace sending Christ to die for you. This is what Christmas is all about. God sending His Son to die for your sins and mine. His grace showered on us and we respond by faith, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, believing that God raised him from the dead, and then believing that he's the Savior of the world and giving our lives to him, asking him to forgive our sins. We're made right with God by grace through faith. The only question is, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Lord God, we thank you for the recording of the life of Abraham in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and showing us that being made right with you from the very beginning, Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, is by grace through faith. It's not by works that we do. We can't be good enough to reach your perfect standard. If you've never committed your life to Christ, I invite you to do that right now as we pray. I'll just give you a minute. You tell Christ that you believe in him, that he's the son of God. He was raised from the dead. You thank him for dying for your sins and invite him into your life. You can do that right now. All of us, you can thank God that salvation does not depend on how good you are, but by your faith in Christ. Uh, I'll give you a minute to pray right now. Thank you, God, for your grace on Abraham, the father of a great nation and really our father in faith as well. And we thank you that if we put our faith in you and your son, Jesus Christ, we can have a relationship with you. We can have you living inside of us and we can have uh, faith uh, and understand what Christmas is all about, accepting your grace through our response in faith. In Jesus' name we pray.